welcome to a new episode of Ray Minds Engineering. We're going to discuss the topic of beam analysis. The topics we're going to discuss today are the types of beams, what are the different types of beams, and how and when to use each one of them, and what are the effects on the structural response based on the type of beam we use to model our beam. Next, we're going to discuss geometrical linearity. We're going to explain what is geometrical nonlinearity and when should we use geometrically nonlinear analysis to represent and model our beam. Afterwards, we're going to discuss material linearity, where we're going to show the most commonly used stress strain curves to idealize beams and when to use each and every single one of them and when is it worth it. Next, we're going to discuss the impact of load location on the structural response, meaning what is the impact of the load location on the internal forces inside of the beam, and how we can use this knowledge to determine the most critical load location in the beam in order to design the most economical beam possible. Next, we're going to discuss influence of stiffness in beams and how the stiffness influences the internal forces inside of the beam based on whether or not the beam is structurally determinate. Finally, we're going to discuss some practical tips on utilizing all this knowledge that we will learn in this video. Let's discuss the different types of beams. The first beam is the Euler Bernoulli beam. The Euler Bernoulli beam is the simplest and most commonly used type of beams to model beams in structural engineering. It has the assumption that when the beam deforms, the cross section of the beam remains perpendicular to the center line of the beam. Moreover, this type of beam has only a single degree of freedom. This degree of freedom is a function of x, which runs along the length of the beam. Adding one layer of complexity is the Timoshenko beam. The Timoshenko beam is usually used to analyze and model deeper beams. Unlike the Euler Bernoulli beam, the cross sections in the Timoshenko beam do not remain perpendicular to the center line of the beam, and the beam has two degrees of freedom. One is theta, which is the rotation of the cross section based on the center line along the length of the beam, and both u and theta are functions of x. A general rule of thumb that we can use to determine which beam model to use is the length to depth ratio. Whenever the length to depth ratio is greater than or equal to 10, the use of Euler Bernoulli beam suffices to capture the real effects on the structural response. But whenever this is not the case, the use of Timoshenko beams is a must. Geometrical linearity and second order analysis. What is nonlinearity? Imagine having a spring that is being compressed by a force with magnitude of lambda f. This force displaces the spring by a magnitude of x. The real behavior of the displacement x as lambda increases looks as follows. In the first portion of the curve, we notice that the relationship between the force and the displacement is linearly proportional, such that, for example, if we apply two newtons of force, we obtain two millimeters of deformation. Three newtons of force, three millimeters of deformation, so on, until we reach this exponentially increasing part of the curve, where, for example, if we apply eight newtons of force, we receive only seven millimeters and so on. Once the relationship between the applied force and the structural response or the displacement is not longer proportionally linear, this is now called a nonlinear zone or nonlinearity. So how to account for this nonlinearity? There are multiple ways, but one of these ways is to conduct a second order analysis. In order to understand what a second order analysis is, 
we need to first discuss what a first order analysis is. A first order analysis uses equilibrium of forces on the undeformed geometry in order to determine the internal forces inside of the beam. In this case, we have shear forces and bending moment forces developing caused by the applied force F. In second order analysis, the load is applied on the undeformed geometry and then the equilibrium equations are developed. This introduces a new component for the internal forces in the beam that runs in the direction of the running length of the beam, in this case, an axial tensile force. In second order analysis, the deformations are still considered small and thus trigonometric idealizations are made such that sine of theta is equals to theta and cosine of theta is equals to one. And to increase one level of complexity and with it accuracy, we introduce geometrically nonlinear analysis, where the deformations are now considered significantly large and thus trigonometric idealizations are no longer performed. From all those three models, geometrically nonlinear is the most accurate, yet most complex. Now to discuss material nonlinearity. So how does the real stress strain curve in steel looks like? The first part of the stress strain curve is called the elastic zone. In the elastic zone, the relationship between stress and strain is linearly proportional. This, however, is not more the case when the stress exceeds the yield strength of the material. The material afterwards continues to take in more stress, but with each increment increase in stress, the material continues to strain more and more with each step until it finally can no longer hold any stress. And then the material gains even more strain until it finally fractures. This model is however too complex and alternative models are used to model structures by structural engineers. The most common being the following two. We have the elastic model in which the relationship between stress and strain is linearly proportional indefinitely. This assumes that the material will never yield nor fail. Structural engineers, however, only use this model when they are sure that the yield strength would never be exceeded. And thus, most of the times, this model is adequate. The next most commonly used model is the elastic perfectly plastic. And this assumes that the relationship is linear until the yield strength is reached from which the material will start to gain strain indefinitely without any incremental increase in stress. Another less commonly known and used model is the creep model. Creep means that the structure has been exposed to the same load for an extended period of time. And creep has three distinct stages. Once the beam has been loaded, the beam gains some instant initial strain. This strain can be totally elastic or can be divided between elastic and plastic. In the primary stage, the strain rate decreases until it finally stabilizes and becomes constant in the secondary phase. And in the tertiary phase, the strain rate starts accelerating exponentially until finally the material ruptures. A very common example we see in everyday life is when placing a heavy object on a shelf. Once the heavy object is placed on the shelf, the shelf slightly deforms. This deformation only increases with time, and with months and months and sometimes years, it would look something like this. And then once the load is released, the structure springs back, but never to its original undeformed state. This means that creep creates plastic irreversible damage in the structure. Now let's discuss the impact of load location on the structural response. So how do we model this and how is it possible to identify the most critical load location in a beam? Well, one way is to try and place the load on different locations across the length of the beam. And with each step, finding the internal forces or the structural response in the beam, and then from all the considered steps, 
extract the location of the load that generates the highest response. This approach is however very time consuming and can be cut down significantly by the use of influence lines. Influence lines can be generated by hand, but this is most of the times only possible if the structure is statically determinate. If however the structure is not statically determinate, such as in this case, then the use of finite element software is required to generate influence lines as shown below. These are influence lines generated for the bending moment for the beam in the first span. This means that when placing the load at this exact location, we obtain the maximum bending moment in the first span of this beam. Similarly, influence lines has been generated for the shear in the first span. This means that when the load is placed in this location, we obtain the highest shear in this beam. Now let's look at the video showing how the beam deforms as the load moves from left to right across the length of the beam. We can see that this matches the behavior shown by the influence lines of the bending moment because when the load was at this location in the beam, the curvature was the highest. In order to study the effects of stiffness in beams, several models have been generated and analyzed to observe the differences in structural response, starting with the statically determinant beam with different stiffness. Here we can see that the left side of the beam has a higher stiffness than the right side of the beam. We can also see that this beam is statically determinate because the left side is pin supported and the right side is roller supported. In this case, the shear response looks as follows, which means that the reaction forces at the right and the left side of the beam are 5000 newtons each facing upwards. The next model shows a statically determinant beam with the same stiffness across the entire length of the beam. In this model, we observe the same result. Next, we see a statically indeterminate beam with different stiffnesses. This is statically indeterminate because the left and right support are both fixed. Here we can see that the shear forces have been unequally divided amongst both beams and more shear force has been developed in the beam with a higher stiffness. While when modeling the same statically indeterminate beam but with the same stiffness across the length of the beam, we observe the same previous result similar to the one with statically determinate beam. This leads us to a conclusion that if the beam is statically determinate, the stiffness does not play a role in the distribution of internal forces in the beam and vice versa. Let's go through a practical example and see the importance of what we have learned today. This is an example showing how neglecting nonlinear effects, when necessary, can be detrimental. The following shows the linear analysis results. Consider having the following curved beam problem with a point load applied downwards on the beam at its center. As expected, we get the following reaction forces at both ends of the beam. We see that due to the symmetry, the reaction forces are the same in the vertical direction and they're also the same in the horizontal direction with opposite signs. Here we can see the actual force diagram on the bottom left and the shear diagram on the bottom right. We see also that the maximum axial forces are obtained near the supports and all the axial forces are in compression. We can also see that we obtain the highest shear forces at the center of the beam, with the shear forces being equal but opposite in signs at either ends of the beam. The deformed shape of this analysis looks as follows. However, when conducting a nonlinear analysis, the results can vary largely. This is the deformed shape of the nonlinear analysis. We can see that the beam snapped through 
and is now below both supports. This deformed shape causes the horizontal reaction forces to act in tension against the beam, unlike how they acted in compression when it comes to a linear analysis. This also makes all the axial forces inside the beam to be tensile forces instead of compressive forces in the case of a linear analysis. Also, the distribution of shear varies largely than that of the linear analysis results. This example shows that when exposed to large deformations, the values obtained from a nonlinear analysis vary largely than those obtained from a linear analysis, making a nonlinear analysis a must in order to obtain as close results to reality as possible. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.